We find ourselves in part 14 of uh, the seasons of our lives. Sounds like an American soap opera, doesn't it? When we've looked at the life of David. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And I, I've, I've entitled my message this morning, The Season of the King's Physical Return. In 2 Samuel 19 and verse 10, if you remember the last time we talked, uh, last Sunday night I think it was, about Absalom. And that, you know, we need God to fight for us. If you're in a position this morning where you're fighting for yourself, it shows a true lack of trust in God. I know that's, that's a hard one, it feels like a slap around the face if you are really trying to fight. But, you know, we have to trust God, especially with what he's spoken over our lives. And David finds himself in a place, although... Absalom has now been removed from the throne by God himself, actually. A donkey and his hair catches him in a tree and he dies. But he's still not sitting in the throne. David is still in exile. He finds himself in a place of exile. And these these are the words that some of the people say, some of the elders in, in the city say. And Absalom, who was anointed to rule over us, has died in battle. So why does nobody have a word about bringing the king back? Why does no one have a word about bringing the king back? I think it's the Revised Standard Version that puts it this way. Has nobody got a word about bringing back the king? So really, that's what I want us to think about this morning. Has no one got a word about bringing back the king? I believe that before Jesus comes back, that he is making preparation. That the bride needs to get herself ready. The return of Jesus Christ will not be some random event. Although we do not know the day or the hour, this Bible is very specific about that, it also says us to about us it will not take us unawares. So I believe before Jesus comes back again, there is a time of preparation. And we need a word about bringing back the king. That's what's going to happen. God is going to start to speak from heaven and prepare his bride and get his people ready for his return. You know, so often we talk about God setting a time to return, and I was only praying this morning, if you don't agree with me, you don't have to agree with me. But I just felt the Lord whisper into my heart. You see, my people talk about so much about when will I make my return. He said, I'm waiting for my bride to be desperate enough to ask me to come back. You know, in generations gone before, they've been in hungering for the return of Jesus. In our generation, we're hungering for everything but the return of Jesus. You know, so we can build bigger churches and get bigger names for ourselves. But, you know, in this world, in the state that it's in now, has nobody in the church got a, a word about bringing back the king? Because he's the only one that's going to put this thing right, isn't he? Yeah. When the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. This is not popular theology, is it? And I believe that the call to prayer... And especially over the last few weeks, God's intense call to us to holiness and to hear his voice prophetically. I believe we are being prepared for the return of the king. And we need as a church to preach this as the glorious hope it always has been. The early church were with us 100%. It was part of their doctrine and theology. They not only preached Christ and him crucified and him right at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us, they preached about the king coming back. They talked about the return of Jesus to the Mount of Olives. They said, we better get ready because the same Jesus that we saw leave is coming back again. And this is the glorious hope of the church. In fact, they used to greet each other with this phrase, didn't they? Maranatha. Jesus is coming soon. You know, it's important what we say. Do you know there's more centenarians, if that's the right word, people over 100 in Israel than anywhere on the face of God's earth? Do you know Why? Many of them, well, a lot of them, greet, them, greet themselves with this little saying, live to be 120. What we say has a profound effect on the atmosphere we live in. Yeah. Don't, don't just dismiss that as being stupidity. You go around moaning long enough, you'll, you'll get what you get. And we've said that before, haven't we? We said that last week, so I'm not going to go down that rabbit trail, although there's a beer all day. Before Jesus' physical return and his feet touch the Mount of Olives, I believe that in many ways the king is going to come afresh to his people and make us ready for his glorious return. And our glorious uniting with him. 
Before Jesus came the first time, John the Baptist came, didn't he, preaching in the wilderness. He came, repeat, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And Isaiah prophesied about him, I am sending a messenger ahead of you, one who will prepare the way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. People have called John's ministry a forerunner ministry, but really what he was doing was preparing the people for the king to come. And the Bible talks about that same spirit, that same anointing coming in our day, in our generation, that spirit of Elijah, the spirit of John the Baptist, that would make a way for the king to come back again. And I believe now that God is raising a word about bringing back the king. And um, God is speaking words in order to get us ready, to prepare us. And I believe he started the process. So what is the, what's, the, what's the words that God is speaking from heaven? What are the words that his people are responding to in terms of bringing back the king? Well, I've just got four this morning. There is a word about being prepared. See, over many generations, the church has mimicked the children of Israel in their behaviour. Often being cold, a little time being warm and mostly being lukewarm. Playing the harlot. Jesus is not coming back for a lukewarm or adulterous church. And I say this in all sincerity. When he meets us at the altar and he lifts the veil, he's going to go, wow, that's what I paid for. That's what I laid down my life for. But that's what the scripture says, doesn't it? He will see of the travail of his soul and he'll go, wow, she's beautiful. I'm satisfied. It's not like the old Rachel and Leah story. I was thinking about that in bed last night, you know. He got conned, didn't he, old Jacob? He got the girl with the bulletproof glasses first. Just terrible. God is not going to lift the veil and go, it's the ugly sister. It's true. It's true. He will see of the travail of his soul and he will be satisfied. He will say to his father, that was what Calvary was all about. Every blood, drop of blood I shed, that was for that bride. And she's mine. And she's mine forever. It was St. Augustine, you know, I'll say this now. I'll probably get shot for saying it, but I'm going to say it anyway. There's a lot of saints, and we always knock the Catholics for venerating people. We're just as bad in the Pentecostal church. Walking around making superheroes out of people. You know, I, I was reading the scripture the other day, it just blew me out of the water. He said, Elijah was a man just like us. Don't be putting people on pedestals as if some kind of, you know, I want, I want Smith Wigglesworth anointing. I'll tell you what, I want Jesus' anointing. He was just anointed by God. So why does well, I want Wigglesworth's anointing? I want Jesus' anointing. I'll just say that in passing. Because some of the saints have said some good things and some of them have said some ridiculous things. And St. Augustine says this, and it's, it's, it's a horrible saying really. He said, the church may be a whore, but she's my mother. Well, those days have to finish. He's talking about a desperate church. He was talking about a broken church, but a church that still brought him to salvation. I understand that. But when we're talking about the last day bride, we're not talking about a broken, messed up church anymore. We're not talking about a bride that is marred and scarred. We're talking about one that has made herself ready. The Bible says without spot, wrinkle or blemish. Wow, this is a huge challenge. Because we can't live like other generations have lived in terms of church life. Not if we want the king to come back, we can't. You can do what you like if you want the king to remain where he is. But he's coming back for his bride that's ready. Well, this is hard stuff, isn't it? The church has to live like her groom is returning. Instead of all the infighting, splits and divisions. So we need to be prepared. The second word, I believe, that about bringing back the king is this. We need to give him his throne back. We, do not, we know that we know that we know that a throne is a place where a king rules from. It's his seat of authority and power. It's not just a wooden chair where he sits, but it's where he holds court and where his authority flows from. Aren't you glad this morning that Jesus says all authority has been given to me in both heaven and earth? He's our God, isn't he, this morning? And because he's, he's got that authority, he said to us, you can go and make disciples of all nations. So some of that authority is given over to us. I was saying to, um, to Chris the other day, I gave him a word about um, when he was young copper and he used to arrest people. 
And uh, so God wants to do that again for you in the spiritual realm. You know, the day he was given his badge to uh, deal with, princip- to deal with uh, people who were breaking the law, he didn't have to ring up the chief constable every time he wanted to arrest somebody because the authority had been given to him. You know, we, we do not understand, I don't think, sometimes the authority that has been given to us because of what Jesus carries upon him. But we have got to make room for him. And um, Jesus has a throne, but he's got several thrones, actually. He's sitting on a throne right now at the right hand of the Father. And he's making intercession for us. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? He's still serving. He's still got a servant's heart and spirit, even now. Um, so we, I think we understand that the, he has a throne in heaven. He has a literal throne here on earth. The Bible tells us that one day he will, his feet will touch the Mount of Olives and he will sit on the throne of his father, David. Interesting, in the days of our lives by David. He's going to sit on David's throne one day. In Jerusalem, physical Jerusalem. Not pretend Jerusalem. This is real now. Jesus is going to come back to a physical place. And he's going to rule without rival. But until then, he has chosen by the Holy Spirit to make our hearts his throne. So often we decide that we will rule our own lives. And you know, God has began to speak to us over these last few weeks again about his lordship. We so often say that we are ruled and directed by him, but do everything but let him rule and direct our lives. The Lord is coming back for a bride that totally submits to him. That says, you're our God and nothing else. You're our king and nothing else will do. Just a challenge, isn't it, really? A a true challenge to us this morning. We talk really a lot about Jesus being Lord. And then we pray one thing, then we live out another thing. And then we say we're going to do this and we live the opposite way. And then we read it in the Bible and say, wow, that's fantastic. And then go and do the complete opposite. There's a real challenge that we put Jesus first place today. Which really falls to my third point. Is the word about bringing back the king is a word about passionate love. God wrote some very powerful things to uh, the church. The churches in the um, New Testament. In the book of Revelation. And one in particular to the book of Ephesus. He says this. These things say to him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labour, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you've tested those who say they are apostles and not, and you found them to be lawyers. You've you've been preserved and have patience, have laboured for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, this I have against you. You have left your first love. This sounds like a good church to me. I don't know about you. There's nothing there apart from that last sentence that leads to me to believe that these are a bad bunch. They're a good church. They've worked hard. God's commending them for their integrity. Boy, if you want to see how a culture of honour works, look at Ephesus. They're doing it. They hate evil. They've worked hard. But nonetheless, this I have against you, Jesus said. You're not passionately in love with me. What you're doing is not born out of a passion and a love. It's born out of something else, whether that's duty or habit, whatever it might be, religion, but you're not passionately in love with me. And I actually think that churches can survive even a couple of generations just on good ethos, good culture. But eventually we are found out because when we don't passionately love Christ, eventually that will fade and we'll be brought down to the lowest common denominator. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nevertheless, I have this against you. See, God wants a lover. He doesn't want a slave girl. He wants passion. He doesn't want a program. I don't know about... I, sometimes I get frustrated with the Bible because some of it seems a bit just too beyond, doesn't it? Like, like Mary and Martha, that story naturally makes me want to get angry at Mary because she's a really lazy wench, isn't she? While the sister's doing all the cooking, she's, she's just hanging around Jesus. She needs to get a life, doesn't she? Well, that's not what Jesus said. He said, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. In fact, only one thing. Mary's chosen the better, and it will not be taken from her. 
The 24-hour prayer movement in Kansas now has been going for nearly two decades, and they've got a strap line, and it's this one thing. One thing is that passionate love for Jesus. Without that passionate love for Jesus, the church is just a religious organisation. And we are supposed to be in love and devoted to Christ. Because when we are devoted and in love with Christ, you know what happens? We get in love with each other and we fulfil the two greatest commandments. Absolutely spot on. That is without a shadow of a doubt. When we love God with all our hearts, it's going to be very difficult to not love other people. When we are so enamoured with his love and his grace and his mercy, it's overtook us. What's that scripture, Andy? You, you're in the prayer meeting the other morning. About, from the Song of Solomon, I, I, I can't, it's, it's something like the, the, the girl, she's in love with the king so much, she's on her bed sleeping. She says, although my body slept, my heart kept on racing. That's what God's looking for. Although I'm not in church, man, I'm still in love with Jesus. He's my, he's my waking passion, he's my everyday thought, he's, he's all in all that I need. And I guess that really brings me on to my last point, which is the word is about singleness of heart. The word about bringing back the king is about singleness of heart. Which I guess comes out of the three when we're prepared, when we put God in his right place and we're passionate in love with him. It does drive singleness of heart and purpose in us. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jeremiah says this, I will give them singleness of heart and action so that they will always fear me and that they will go well and it will go well with them and their children after them. Ezekiel says, I will give them singleness of heart, put a new spirit within them. I will take away the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. God's call to Israel and God's call to his church this morning is for that singleness of purpose, that singleness of devotion. Just one thing. We make it about so many other things, don't we? But it's just about the one thing. It's all about him. We've said it so very often. It's about an audience of one. I didn't enjoy the worship this morning, Pastor. Good, it wasn't for you. It wasn't for you. I think the worship's a bit down in it. Well, just book your ideas up and worship God better than... We talk like these are some kind of negotiables. If we don't praise him, friends of very stones will cry out. God is just looking for that single-mindedness of heart. I think for many of us, we're in a place right now, and I, I, I feel for many of you, it's quite difficult in leading this church because I see so much more than perhaps others see because I see a lot of people's lives over, over the week as well as in the week. And I know for many of you, you're fighting struggles at the moment. And I think the word that God would bring to you this morning is that he wants to give you, if you'll be single-hearted towards him, he's going to give you wisdom that will unlock the situation that you find yourself in and bring you the answers that you're looking for. I think it's incredibly important. James says this, But if we lack wisdom, let us ask God, who gives us to all generously, without reproach. And it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That man ought to expect nothing, to think that we accept anything from God, because he's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. God is not looking for double-mindedness. If we will pursue him, if we will seek first his kingdom, he will order the rest. All these things will be added to you. For some of us, we're in a place we almost feel like if we seek God first, everything else will be taken away. Because if we God that, give God that time, what about my family? If we give God that time, what about my work situation? If I God give, give God that time, what, what about... You seek first the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. All of these things won't be taken away. They'll be added to you. God will bring you into a place where everything else just falls into place. He is the cornerstone. He's that corner piece. You know, my mum used to love doing jigsaws. It's not so much now, but she used to get the corner pieces out first. You can't do it start in the middle. And sometimes we need a corner piece put in. And, it's, and for us, it's the single-mindedness of the kingdom of God. You need to put that piece in place first. 
Because if you don't build from that peace, you're building from nowhere. You're an unstable person and the wind will blow you from one direction to another. I think we've all been there. Some of us have been there this week. Loving God, doubting God. Thinking that it's all sorted, feeling it's all a tragedy. Up one minute, down the next. I'm not saying it's not easy and that we don't go through a roller coaster of emotions. That would be foolishness. But we do need to be single-minded towards God and allow him to bring his wisdom into our... If we lack wisdom, just ask God. And we need to have faith and just trust and believe and not doubt. And not doubt. These are difficult words, I know. But God is looking for that single mindedness. If Jesus is truly to be the king, we must put him first place in our living. The king is coming back and I believe there is a day where the word of the Lord is coming about bringing back the king. In fact, these words in Hebrews, I think, speak volumes and have been something that God laid on my heart right from the last sort of two and a half years, especially as the prayers begun to ramp up. And at many seasons of this church life and my life, God has reminded me of these verses. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those who did not escape when they refused him who warned them on the earth, much less will they escape who turns away from him who warns from heaven. His voice shook the earth then. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of the things that can be shaken as the created thing. So the things that which cannot be shaken will remain. Therefore, since we received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we offer to God acceptable service and reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. What Hebrews is saying, what the writer of the Hebrews is saying is, before Jesus comes back again, God is going to shake everything. You've got to look around this world and understand that's what's going on right now. There's an unprecedented shaking of absolutely everything. Who in, that, who in their right mind, I don't want to even get political, but who in their right mind could have predicted what the last 12 months have, have done in politics in this nation and the nations of the world? That whole, whole chunks of people have swung from left to right and back again. Yeah. This is not normal living. Something's shaking. Yeah. The very foundations of our society is shaking. Yeah. We live in a generation that is just so far away from the... But I believe that God is shaking. I'm going to shake everything till that which cannot be shaken, which is my kingdom, which is his rule in our lives, that only that remains. And if we get that, then we've really got it. So this morning, here in Sedgley, I believe God is shaking us and preparing us. I like those elders of old. I, I wanted to ask you this question this morning. Has nobody got a word about bringing back the king? I believe we do. We need him. We need him to come back. We need him to come back and do what he's promised to do. His word is full of so many promises yet to be fulfilled. And do you know what? In a moment of time, he can fulfil them all. I think, oh, it'll take God a long time to fulfil all the Bible prophecies. Are you foolish? Did you see his first coming? He, he can sweep through the skies and fulfil them all in a moment. And he will, as he comes back. So this has not been an easy word this morning, because it's a challenge to us. Every time we talk about Jesus' lordship on our lives, it has a real knock-on effect, doesn't it, on not only how we live, but how we treat other people, and it's... It's a huge one again, and I'm not going to bang that drum either this morning. But let's just, let's just pray, can we? Ask God to. If you don't get anything else, I just want that word to go around in your, your, your ears this week. Has nobody got a word about bringing back the king? God is waiting on his bride. And I think it's the other way around. He desperately wants to be with his church. I just think sometimes his church don't desperately want to be with him. Bless you, Lord.